Excuse me. <laughs> that one? Okay. We will now have the pleasure of uh, hearing Dominique Lestel. He will talk about ethology, ethnology and communication with the extraterrestrial intelligence. Dominique is Associate Professor at the École Normale Supérieure, also known as ANS or ONS. Ernest. Ernest, voilà. A founding member of the Department of Cognitive Science at ONS, Dr. Lestel is also a member of its Department of Philosophy. Since 1998, he also has been a researcher at the Museum National d'Histoire Naturelle, where he became the director of the Ethoecology and Cognitive Ethology Research Group of the Laboratory <coughs> of Eco-Anthropology and Ethnobiology. Dr. Lestel is developing a philosophical anthropology that maintains first that to be human is to establish particularly strong connections to other animals, and second, that new technologies could significantly improve these connections. His books include L'Animal Singulier, 2004, Et les Grands Singes, L'Humanité au fond des yeux, des yeux 2005, Les animaux sont-ils intelligents 2006. Les origines animales anima de la culture 2009. L'animal est l'avenir et is l'avenir de l'homme 2010. Et Apologie du carnivore 2011. Thank you. Apologie du carnivore and the friends of, the friends of my friends um, will appear soon at Columbia University Press in an English translation. So I wish to tell you right now about uh, some philosophical problems because I'm mainly a, philo a philosopher, but we could say a field philosopher, a philosopher who uh, wish to understand the world and not only to, uh, to comment on commentators. So the question I wish to discuss here is a question of evolution uh, and, and the interactions with uh, extraterrestrial intelligence, or the potential interactions with extraterrestrial um, intelligence. So, what what to communicate mean is the first questions. Uh, the thirst of uh, the thirst of an ET intelligence and the wish to to communicate with ET uh, show numerous the philosophical problems we have to to deal with. And one of the main is uh, to know what it means to communicate. And uh, in that way, uh, we could not be satisfied with a trivial definition of information transmission. I mean, communication is to transmit information from uh, one people to another one. But there is also the question about the fact that such a communication with ET could precisely not be a communication, at least in the sense we have in mind. So the central problem of the meeting with ET at the crossroad of ethology and ethnology. This is one of the main parts of the, of the paper. Two main pitfalls. Uh, to consider first that such a task is a purely physical one, I mean to communicate, um, or a purely biological one, to identify a non-human species and to establish a communication with it as with an animal. So. Another pitfall is to consider that such a task is only an ethnological one and that the problem is to allow two cultures to establish a meaningful contact. So one pitfall, the ethnological one, to consider that human ET communications could be a kind of human animal communication. Second pitfall, uh, to consider that we are in the situation of two human cultures communicating one with the other. To identify an ET civilization is a particularly difficult task because it is both an ethological and an ethnological task. That's the main point. 
We already know how to establish contact with non-human animals, but we have never communicated with natural agents with whom we have never shared any common phylogenetic or cultural history, and with whom we have yet never been in contact in one way or the other. I think that this is one of the key points of a communication with an ET uh, civilization. So, we have to go beyond both ethology and ethnology. We could find inspiration from ethology to thin contact between two quite different biological species, and inspiration from ethnology to thin contact between two quite different cultures, but to establish a contact between different sets of living beings without any common biological history and without any common cultural histories is a goal without any precedent in the history of humankind, up to my knowledge. So, ethology of communication with ET. We have no common genes. On Earth, humans share genes with all living beings, uh, even the, the lowest ones. Uh, around 99% or uh, around between 95 and 99% of gen of genes uh, shared with chimpanzees. I have to confess I do, do not know exactly what it really means, but what is sure is that we are very close from a genetical point of view from the chimpanzee. But we have also a lot with potatoes or with carrots and so on. With ET, the probability that we will have no common genes at all is almost sure. When I say almost, I, I, think, I think that uh, some, uh, some um, uh, alien, uh, alien uh, beings could have a common origins with, uh, with humans in a way or another. So one thing we could be sure about uh, aliens, I think, is that they have been designed by natural evolution. If ET are living beings, they have been designed through a natural evolution. And uh, I'm very close to one of the pre president talk about evolutionary psychology, even if I wish to take evolutionary uh, psychology with, uh, 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 with um, uh, cautious. Uh, the almost is not trivial at all. Uh, it could uh, indeed be artificial creatures that have become or not autonomous agents, but have been built by other living beings and been very different from a creature that would have resulted from a natural evolution. What, what I wish to, to say here is that uh, we could meet not alien as such, not ET intelligences as such, but artifacts being designed by these uh, uh, creatures, and that we have to take this into account uh, especially if we wish to add a psychological dimension about our um, communications. One of the key points is the pre-predator landscape. In other words, um, an, an intelligence, a big intelligence, has been designed vraisemblably through a pre-predator um, process. And usually, it's not the prey that survives. It's more, much more the predator. Politics. It's very, uh, prob uh, the probability is very high that uh, these uh, creatures uh, could have developed complex social systems, which means also that they could have antagonist trends within their society, and we have to take into account of that. We already have such process among some animals like uh, raven, dolphins, or chimpanzees. The problem of the communication with uh, ET is that that, that communication be will be both semantic about something and existential telling that we do exist. And this is uh, an important point. There is also the option of no communication. Uh, I'll take uh, another time. Therefore, that it could not li look like what we are looking for when we are waiting for a message is a point we al always have to, to, uh, to take into, um, into our mind. So communications of a new class. Contact with ET cultures will be very different from everything we already know at the crossroad of ethology and ethnology. So we have three kinds of contacts. This is a summary of what I have already said. Contact of type one between a uh, uh, human and animal. Contact of type two between um, uh, two different kinds of cultures and contact of type three between heterogeneous advanced cultural societies and that 
uh, will be uh, the, the set in which uh, human ET communications will be. One of the, one of the uh, feature of ET, human ET communications uh, would be that that communication could be a far away communication. That could be both a problem and an advantage. Because in a close communication, we will be uh, in front of um, multimodal, immediate, proximal, physical communication, which is much more difficult to deal with than with a far away communication. One of the questions I have already uh, uh, asked this morning is about the fact that we could not be smart enough. I think that this is a big issue, and I wish to, to discuss with uh, some of you uh, more deeply on that point. And uh, it could have an interest about the future of, of, uh, uh, of the city program, because one of the, uh, one of the suggest suggest uh, excuse me, suggestions I could do for the city program would be to improve human uh, in order to, to be able to communicate with such uh, intelligence. Uh, no, another point we could discuss is about the, the questions of language. We have talked a lot about uh, the Rosetta, Rosetta Stone and about the, the, the possibility, the symbolic dimensions of communication and so on. And the language is at the heart of uh, the communication of, we suppose that language is at the heart of the communication of human with alien intelligence. This is not so uh, so true first and second, I think that uh, that could be both, I mean, language, an advantage and a problem to communicate. One of the problem uh, is that we suppose that language is a universal me mean of communication. It means that we could say everything with language. Uh, there is a big discussion between a uh, Benveniste and von Frisch, Benveniste, a French linguist, and von Frisch, uh, the discoverer of uh, the, uh, the B language uh, during the 50s. Benveniste telling to uh, von Frisch that the bees have no language at all because they could not tell, uh, they could not speak about everything, and the language could be, uh, could do that. But this is a, a, um, a gratuitous assumption. No, uh, nothing has proved that language has the possibility to discuss everything. And we could um, wonder whether one of the property of language is precisely to be able to establish the limits of language. I'm not sure at all of that. So to conclude, I wish to, to, to say about uh, the cost of ET communication, not so much discussed. I think that we could discover that it's very costly to, to communicate with uh, ET civilizations and that we are not, maybe not really ready to, to, to be able to engage ourselves in that, uh, this, uh, the, this cost, uh, material cost, but also psychological, sociological, anthropological uh, cost and, psycho and uh, psychical. Uh, cost. The length of, of communication is also an important problem. Uh, I s will suggest uh, maybe that uh, some of the problem could be uh, the necessity to send fractal messages because the length of the message is important. And with uh, fractal messages, we could have messages at different level of uh, length. So I wish to conclude with uh, some propositions, some uh, uh, strong propositions to, to be discussed, some provocative uh, the, uh, propositions. Uh, maybe city is uh, engaged in the wrong direction. It's an hypothesis we could do. I mean, uh, working hypothesis, of course. Um, the, the main reason for which I say that is that uh, the city project has, up to my knowledge at least, never been able to communicate with ET. Um, and that doesn't mean that uh, it has not yet succeeded, but that it works in a wrong direction. I don't know that it's the case. I, I've just said that it could be the case. So we may be new, we, be, we may be uh, need a radical new approaches. Hypothesis: that he should investigate radical new approaches of ET intelligence. Proposition: it should, it should be left. It should left its ethnocentrism 
and in particular is Western centrism. I think that it could be very interesting for the city program to, to, to hire an anthropologist or somebody like that who could be able to discuss that point very deeply. Uh, and it's scientism and it's strong epistemological positions. I, I have no time to, 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 to go further on that point, but I think that the realism and objectivism is not good are not good positions to deal with uh, such a questions. That constructivism, which is not relativism, constructivism could be a better position. It should open also, I think, I think that uh, Thetty should open itself to ethno and anthropologists ready to study seriously and without any censorship the claim of numerous cultures that they are in already in communications with non-human entities like we see in shamanism. in shamanism. When I say seriously, I mean that even in, in the field of anthropology, such a question is a disturbing, problematic question. We could discuss about the meaning of anthropology. I think that it's very difficult for an anthropologist to be able to discuss a taboo uh, situation of our, um, of our uh, culture and that uh, to be ready to deal with non-human entities such as uh, the, some spirits or, or ghosts uh, that uh, shamans used to tell with could be a good way. What I wish to say here is that for some people, these entities could be kinds of extraterrestrial entities. I mean, we are not ne necessarily in a situation where uh, in, the, uh, in the physical space, we have to, uh, to try to meet extraterrestrial civilizations, maybe through the complexity of the space-time situation that physicists show us, we could have other ways to deal with um, these um, entities. Another, uh, uh, an example is the experience recently made uh, on the G D DMT, that which is a psychoactive drug, that have been experimented by a psychologist who have shown that m in most, most of his, uh, his patients on which he has experimented that drug, that psychoactive drug, uh, have met or said they have met some entities. It doesn't, it doesn't, well, the question is an open question, but I think that we have to deal with such questions. To conclude, I should say that we have to uh, may maybe that the city program has to adopt a strong uh, Popperian approach, adopt all possible assumptions, even the more foolish, and test them to refute them. And last uh, proposition, hybridity and human self-transformation. I'm not sure that human, as it is right now, is able to be able to deal with a question such like uh, the uh, interactions and the communications with extraterrestrial entities. And maybe we have to think about the possibility to transform, um, to transform what a uh, human is, to transform the, the human uh, creatures in order to be able to interact with these uh, creatures. OK, we could, uh, we could stop here for some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that, that was very interesting. I'm wondering if you make a distinction between SETI and UFOlogy. And uh, if you uh, the study of unidentified flying objects. Let, let yeah. me elaborate for just a minute. Yeah. 10,000 uh, unidentified flying objects were reported this July to the uh, a reporting center. Uh, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest a problem right off the bat, because I'm very interested in UFOs, but not for the reason that most people would think. I'm interested because what it tells, about, tells me about human minds. And there is a very radical difference in terms of information processing among scientists and people who are enthusiastic about UFOs, with some exceptions, okay? And uh, it's, it's an impenetrable uh, difference. It can't be resolved in the absence of clear-cut data, which is not there. And if the data does appear there, it will be ignored and misinterpreted. So what I'm trying to ask is, whereas I, I see some value in what you have to say, uh, do we really want to rush into this uh, really monster kind of, uh, I'm sorry, the word that comes to mind is mess. I, th I think it's interesting. I, I personally think it's interesting. But <clears throat> there's different 
ways of reality testing. Okay? Scientists look at external reality to judge their thinking. Other people, not just ufology, and, and not all of them do it, they look at internal standards mm -hmm. to evaluate the evidence. So my question in a nutshell is, would you, how would you make a distinction from what, you, what you're interested in and ufology, UFO studies as they're known today, mm -hmm. and how would you try to um, divvy up the pie not to follow countless, and I mean countless, false leads, if that's okay. Question. Okay, thank you for your questions. Um, my answer will be a complex one. Um, I, d I, I had not in mind uh, UFOs uh, in, my, uh, in my talk. Uh, I had more in mind um, entities uh, discussed by uh, some anthropologists and ethno-psychiatrists in, uh, in shamanism, in voodoo, and in, uh, in, uh, in fields like that. Nevertheless, I think that uh, the opposition, the, uh, the, um, the controversial uh, posture between a city and a UFO has to be think about. Uh, I don't think that it's the same. I, I'm sure it's not the same. I think that city has uh, a posture, um, a, a kind of posture which is quite different from the UFO posture. But I think that the realist, what I have called the realist approach of, uh, of city uh, could be a rethink, rethought, could be rethought um, with the help of anthropologists working with, uh, with shamanism and, and the and anti underlying entities. In a second step, maybe we could try to find connections with UFO, but not necessarily in a first step. I mean for social... Uh, and um, yeah, social reasons we have to take into account. In other, w in other words, it's an hot issue. We not necessarily have to add that hot issue to an already hot issue. That's kind of a complicated topic, so maybe we'll talk after. Thank you very much. One of the things that you uh, themes that you return to a lot is this idea of are we ready? Are we ready to understand it either intellectually or emotionally or sociologically? And uh, this uh, brings to mind the fact that we may yet get a message whether we're ready for it in any of those contexts or not. Um, I just would like to think about text analysis. Uh, the, the philosopher Jacques Derrida uh, in the 20th century suggested that the meaning of any text is deferred in the sense that uh, once it's out of the writer's hands, uh, it gets treated differently over time as people change their perspectives. In other words, it's a very subjective interpretation. And I would just like to know, do, do you see any parallel with Derrida's work and uh, how sort of a deferral of meaning uh, could, could affect the way we interpret messages that we've received over time as they're gradually decoded or as the society changes? Thank you. First of all, two things. Uh, the, first, the first thing is that I do not think that we are not ready. I think worst, I think that we may be never ready. And second point um, about Jack Derrida, I, I, I'm um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a complex uh, relationship with Derrida, uh, with Derrida and ideas, much more with Derrida and atmosphere, because for many years at Ecole Normale Supérieure, I have had uh, Derrida's office. So I have a uh, full of Derrida's <laughs> atmospheres, but whatever it could mean uh, from a, a cognitive point of view. Uh, but uh, that, that idea about the necessity to, the, well, the, the modification of interpretation is, uh, I think, a right, a right thing. But we have to, to translate it into uh, a, a regular human language. I mean, uh, Derrida's text into uh, a, a, uh, a regular human language. Uh, I think it's, it's right, and I think that we have to deal with that question it's about the dynamics of translations during time and, during, and uh, the fact that some uh, interpretations also depend of other interpretations and that there is a, a kind of uh, a very complex process involved in the, in, the, in the stuff. What is interesting with the city program is precisely that we are not only in interpretation, we are also in a way to try to find actions in order to 
uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to be able to communicate with other. Maybe dangerous actions. I think that uh, all this stuff to, to send messages all over the cosmos is a very dangerous uh, idea. But we try to do actions which is very important to solve, solve some of the problem of interpretations. I, I think that interpre the, the interpretation of interpretations about interpretations is mainly an insoluble problem as soon as you stay in interpretation alone. So from de deridization of SETI to ants and bees, <laughs> um, I, I guess this is a kind of clarifying question, but still a very important one for me. What was the point of Benveniste to criticize von Frisch? Did, did he want to say that the bees do not communicate because they don't have intentions? Yes, this is a very trivial point. Yeah, no, no. If not, w what was it then? The, the point, the, the, the um, Benveniste, uh, von Frisch, uh, at that time, had published a big book about bees' language. And Benveniste was against the idea that bees had a language. They could communicate. For Benveniste, there is no problem. They could communicate. What was disturbing for Benveniste was that the bees could have a language and that there could be a non-human language. But the answer and uh, the, the, the point, the focus point of Benveniste was that uh, bees have no language at all, not with uh, Chomsky and arguments that we will have later because uh, there is no grammar and so on, but because uh, language, uh, the B language was only able to speak about uh, the yeah. localization of This is what uh, I thought. Of, uh, of I of mean, fruits. why shouldn't we conceive of creatures that have a, a language re uh, referring to or having reference to a very limited domain of reality? So. I'm not sure to understand the question. Bees have their niche, very precise one. Mm -hmm. they, they know exactly what, what they're about to do. And their language, so to their dance language, is dedicated just to this niche. For, uh, for Benveniste? For, for Fri von Frisch too. Von Frisch was more... Um, was why why, why do, does this not constitute a language? That it, ha it has a reference domain, although very restricted. Because for uh, a, a linguist like Benveniste, one of the key features of a language was to be able to speak of everything. As soon as a language is restricted to a yeah. certain array, it is not a language. Yeah, but, but he assumed, uh, obviously, that our yeah. language can speak on, uh, about anything. That's, that's what and I have uh, said. Th this that is, there this is, is no probably proof, wrong. There is no proof that okay. the language could uh, speak about everything and that uh, we could even uh, figure out uh, a bad situation in which the structure itself of the language is a deceptive system that could allow us that, is, that it is able to speak about everything, which it doesn't. So the question, the true question, uh, in that controversy is to know whether we could empirically find a way to prove, or logically, or to, to, to find a way to prove that l a, a human language is able to speak about everything. And if not, what could be a language that would be able to speak of everything? Uh, we have one more question. I have a quick question. Uh, you, you, you predicate uh, the very low probability of, the, of ET having any similarity to our to our own DNA, uh, with the, the new calculation that uh, extrapolate the amount of biological information coming through panspermia, I'm wondering if uh, we can recalculate this. It's uh, the reason for which I have said almost I've been uh, yeah. <laughs> I've been prudent. <laughs> did I did I understand you right as uh, saying that uh, assumptions of SETI are uh, scientism and realism? Yeah, um, and I think you were suggesting an alternative. If we if we set those aside, then we might be open to something like a shamanic encounter with right. another consciousness. Would it be meaningful to keep the scientism and replace realism with constructivism? D does that give us another alternative to yeah. to move a, 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 to open us to other alternatives? But yeah, I, I I could explain in a few words. 
uh, two things. The, 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 the move is uh, to try to take into account uh, other, other fields of human experience. Yeah. And the second point is about realism and constructivism. And uh, very, very quickly, the main difference is that for realism, there is a world uh, outside the observer that the observer could objectively describe. It means without any implication of himself in that description. In the constructivism, we only have access to some constraints of the, of the, of the world. It doesn't mean that we could do anything. We could not. We, uh, constructivism is not a relativism. We have constraints, and we could, and we should, build theories and percep and visions of the world through these constraints, which allow us to to uh, uh, to develop a more creative approach toward the world. Uh, one of the metaphor of one of the great thinker of constructivism, von Glasersfeld, was uh, the idea of climbing. On a, on, a, uh, on, a, on a mountain, you, you have some, uh, some possibilities to, to, to climb, but once you have climbed the, the mountain, you, you have other possibilities, but because you have chosen the first one, other people will come and that will become the, the way. S it works, but other could also work. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.